Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you with us today. If you're a first time listener, welcome to the conversation. We hope to make things entertaining, fun, and light. If you're a return listener, thank you very much. We are excited to share with everybody because of you and our great guests. Our podcast has uh, cracked the top 10 fastest growing podcasts, and that's a pretty good accomplishment for you because there are over a million podcasts in the iTunes store. So that's pretty cool. All right. So before we get on to our guest today for this episode, just the normal house cleaning, don't forget to subscribe. If you don't like where you're listening to the podcast today, just remember there are over 23 different podcast distribution points where you can get this. Um, We are actually also on all the social media platforms and the podcast is also published on YouTube in its full format. And then of course, the most important thing is go to the rexandrewshow.com. So rexandrewshow.com, there you can listen to the podcast with just a normal browser. You can also see the bios of all of our guests, you know, the uh, past, uh, current, and then also upcoming. So a lot of interesting people, information about that and links to their businesses, websites, and what have you. And then also the, some of the fun stuff that we're doing, because we don't just podcast, we're doing a lot of interesting things. So please uh, check out the site. Okay, so that gets rid of the house keeping. Uh, you know all that stuff. If you listen, you can almost turn that out when we get started. But today I got a great guest with me today. Um, he is a podcaster, so, you know, he gets kudos because of that. Okay, so... But he's a very interesting guy and um, close to my age. So I'm pretty excited about that. I can actually talk to somebody that is, uh, can remember some of the things I do. He's a documentary producer and he has a specialty that's really interesting. He is a Beatles, as in the band, a Beatles historian and expert. And so welcome to the show today, David Bedford. David, how are you today? I'm very good, thanks Rex. It's uh, nice to join you from over here in Liverpool. That's right. You're, you know, actually, I've, I've been recording quite a few here the last few days, and you're the second person across the pond. So I had somebody from London this morning. So we are in the UK today. You are most welcome in the UK. That's right. That's right. Good to have you. Okay, so we might have people that are playing along, listening uh, to the podcast and also on their computer. And so if you could, could you give us your website or where you want people to connect with you? online so that they can find you and they can follow along while we have our conversation today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first book I published was called Liddy Pool. So my website is liddypool.com. That's L-I-D-D-Y-P-O-O-L.com. Thank you, thank, thank you for spelling that. <clears throat> All right. Fantastic. Okay. So on our show, which we always talk about here, there's too many interests for just one lifetime. And around the corner is a new discovery. And so today we'll take on a discovery with you, David. What we'd like to know as listeners and myself, because I'm trying to learn something every single day, is we want to know about where you were born, uh, where you grew up. uh, Did you have peers? And I'm going to ask these questions. So if it's too long of a list, we'll come back to it. Did you have siblings? Okay. What types of things did you do as a kid when you had spare time? Now, I'm pretty sure you might have been, you know, you know, working in coal mines or something like that, who knows, on your spare time. <laughs> However, but I'd like to know the things that you were doing as you're growing up, your interests in those things. Um, a little bit about your parents. Okay. So, you yeah. know, what did they do for a living? And, uh, you know, if they're still with us, you know, what that's like and kind of what their perspective is, is having a son that is this Beatles expert. And then, you know, hopscots through your education a little bit. And then how'd you get to here? So, David, let's go on a discovery. Take it away. Okay. So, um, I grew up in uh, in Liverpool, an area called the Dingle. Okay. And that is where Ringo Starr was born. And literally, the street where Ringo was born, it's called Madrin Street. When you get to the bottom, there's uh, a street that goes across the bottom. That's where my back gate was. So, literally, when you came... Out the back of my house was at the bottom of the street where Ringo Starr was born. Wow. And the school I went to, uh, we call it primary, you call it elementary school. Yep. Was St. Silas School. And that is the same school that Ringo had gone to. Um, and later on, I found that was the same school that um, John Lennon's dad, Alf Lennon, had also attended. Um but by the time I started there at the age of four, so that was 1969, of course, that's just as the, the Beatles were breaking up. 
But so I was sort of aware of that growing up in this lovely working class area. Um, you're sort of aware that somebody very, very famous was from that area. And in fact, my oldest friend, and we're still friends now, we've been friends from like, like the age of five, lived in Mandarin Street, almost opposite the house where Ringo was born. Wow. Um, so I, I, that, that, I lived around there till I was 24. Um, fabulous area. And it's, it's one of those strange things where in some books it's been described as, you know, Ringo came from the slums. It, it, it wasn't the slums. It's a okay. lovely, lovely community, lovely working class area. Um, so, so that was nice. Um, you asked about family. Well, I'm one of four children, okay. so I'm, I'm stuck in the middle. Actually, I've got an older sister, and then there's a, a younger brother and sister who were twins. Okay. Um, sadly, we lost uh, my younger sister to cancer when she was only 40, mm. quite a few years back now. Um, but the, the other three of us are still around. The reason we were in Liverpool was because of my dad's profession. And he was a vicar in the Church of England, uh, okay. the Anglican Church. Okay. And so his church, uh, St. Philemon with St. Silas, that was right in the Dingle. So that's that's why we were living there. Okay. Um, my mum had been a school teacher. She gave that up. Um, obviously supporting my dad moving around and having the four of us, which, you know, that, and there's not much room between us. There's only about 20 months between me and my older sister. Uh-huh. And then again, going down as well. So she had all four of us quite close to, to each other. Um, so uh, sadly, neither are with us. Um, my dad, we lost in 2009. Okay. Uh, my mum, we lost just over 12 months ago to, oh. to cancer. Sorry to hear it. To cancer yeah. then, right? Yeah. Okay. So we'll sorry yeah. to hear that they're both gone. All right. So what type of things did you do in your spare time growing up there in Liverpool? Uh, as with a lot of people in the UK, we're obsessed with football, uh, soccer. Yep. As you know, yeah. Absolutely obsessed. And it's, it's one of those things that people have said about Liverpool is it's a very, very tribal place. You're born, you have to take sides. <laughs> so they need to know, are you Catholic or Protestant? That's right. All right. And which football team, Liverpool or Everton? Okay. So I'm Protestant and Liverpool. Oh, okay. So that's how you define yourself. So, yeah. so I mean, I'm just going to make a wisecrack. So does that mean you have Liverpool um, privilege? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but one of the good things is, um, could, I mean, you know how, how tribal sport becomes with yeah. rival sides and there's such a rivalry. The good thing is Liverpool um, in the last two years won the, the English Premier League, uh, the European Champions League, the European Super Cup and the World Club Cup. Okay. Right. That's, uh, that's as good as it can get. That's, that's it. You've, you might as well quit, right? You've done it yeah. all. Um, that's great. And really, and, and we, we love to have fun at the expense of the Evertonians. Um, last time they won a trophy, it was 1995. Oh, my goodness. So yeah. that's that's 26 years ago. Yeah, exactly. And we've just played them, and they've just beaten us for the first time in 20-something games. Oh, my goodness. Uh, but it's, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's so fiercely. <laughs> the rivalry uh, is incredible. Um, so football's been... Uh, a passion of mine since since I was very little. Uh, so when, when you were little, were you out playing in the streets, you know, oh, yeah. kind of with, with soccer? Fantastic. Yeah. And, and it was great because the, the streets were quieter. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, we just gather, get together with friends and just play in, in the back streets. Um, and there's only one of those things I realized many years later when I started doing the, the Beatles stuff, that the house I was kicking my football against belong to Ringo's grandparents. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, thankfully, I never broke one of their windows. Um, they weren't so lucky on the other side of Madrin Street. Um, we did smash a couple of theirs, unfortunately. Um, oh, wow. But it, it, would, it was just great. You know, you, you could play out. You had no worries about going out there. Yeah. Yeah. And the summer holidays when you're off school, you know, you disappear in the morning and you come back when you, your tea was ready. Yeah. I, 
Yeah, so I great memories of childhood, really have. Yeah, that's great. I remember the same type of thing. I lived on a uh, a fairly traffic free, um, you know, street. So uh, again, we grew up playing soccer, you know, football, a lot of that. Yeah. And then a little older, we switched over to American football. But you could play in the street, ride your skateboards yeah. and that stuff. And like you said, in the summertime, school was out. You left the house in the morning and you showed up at when the um, either when it was dinner time or the street lights had turned on. Yeah, and yeah. you had to be in when the street lights turned on. That was yeah. sort of the rule. And then if mom was in a good mood, you could still play outside in the dark in front of the house where she could see you when the street lights were on. So absolutely uh, great memories. Yeah, now, no, it wasn't great. it wasn't dangerous back then. We didn't have traffic. No. There wasn't, you know, people being picked up for sex trafficking or anything exactly. like that. It was it was a pretty um, golden age of uh, being a kid. So that's great. Yeah, it's wonderful. It was such a lovely community because you know, talk to anybody from, from that era. Um and everybody's front door was always open. Yep. You could just you could wander in and out of each other's house, not a problem at all. Everybody would know you. You you'd go into you know your friend's house. Their mum would be there, right? Sit down. You're having something to eat. You weren't yep. asked the question. You were fed. Yeah. You were there. Therefore, you had to be fed, even if you weren't hungry. Yep. That's you had to be fed. You had to be given a drink, and then you're pushed out on your way. Into, it fabulous. It, it was great. Great time to grow up there. Yeah. So, yeah, same thing for me. It was just like that. You, uh, everybody's doors are open. In fact, it created from probably a bad behavior for me because even as an adult, I would like leave the doors open. I mean, that's just, you know, when my uh, kids and friends would come over, you know, they were always welcome. It was, you know, figure out something to eat. And, you know, even to this day, except I've had uh, vehicles rifled through a few times, I hardly lock my vehicles, which is probably a bad, <laughs> bad habit, but. You know, you can't yeah. do that today, but back then, ah, we never did. I mean, it was just, you just left things open. That was the way it was. It's one of those things about community back then. People didn't move house very often. No. So everybody knew everybody around them. Right. And so you had this trust. And if somebody in the local area mm -hmm. tried to do the dirty on somebody else, yeah, somebody would know. And their life wouldn't be worth living. Yeah. So that's for sure. they wouldn't try it. And so it, it was a great sense of community. And I think we, we've lost that. Yeah, for sure. Well, and you meant you touch on something there. You know, the average American now moves about every seven years. My wow. parents, my parents were in that house for like 45 years. It wasn't until my father passed and then it, it was too much. The property was too much for my mother to, to keep. And so that's when they sold it a, a year after he passed. And so, yeah, you just, that's where we grew up. That's where our family was. And I, I grew up in the, the a town called Golden, which is the home of the Coors Brewery. And oh, yeah. um, it was a small community. Everybody knew everybody. And so, yeah, it was just the way it was. Yeah, that was nice. Well, with, I've been in the house that I'm in now. Uh, we've been married, what, 34 years this year. We've been in this house next month, 32 years. Wow. That's great. That's great. So we, we, no, we don't move a lot. Okay. So skipping up, you were a big football fan and it became a part of your life from you were fairly young. Um, what you finished, you know, what we call high school here in the States. Um, yeah. What was next? Did you go off to college? Did you do trade schools? What, what was your initial profession? Because I'm assuming that there wasn't a major in the Beatles uh, at any universities. No, there's, there certainly wasn't. But the reason when you told me you left your car unlocked, I went, is because I went into insurance. So, so my career from school, I left school at 18. Okay. And so we've done the first set of exams at 16. Then you do your advanced levels uh, at 18. And I, I didn't go to university or college. I went straight into work. Okay. Um, and I stayed in, in that job for 17 years. Um, okay. Started at the bottom, worked my way up. I was general insurance. So it was your basic things like cars, motorbikes, uh, then houses, uh, and that kind of to that side of the insurance world. Um, ended up going from the underwriting in, into the sales. So I became a sales manager. Um, spent six months working down in Birmingham, which is about halfway between Liverpool and London, about mm -hmm. 100 miles from here. Um, and then came back up 
straight away. Still based in, in Liverpool and um, then travelling up around uh, Lancashire. So it's about travelling to about 40 miles or so each way every day. Okay. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. I was, I was a really good job, um, which then sort of came to a halt quite unexpectedly. Um, when was it? It's uh, summer of 2000 when I had not been feeling well and they thought I developed rheumatoid arthritis uh, in my shoulder mm-hmm. and I was starting to feel unwell and I went to the doctor and I said, look, I, I feel absolutely lousy. Right. I'm on first tablets and stuff and he said, I've been telling you this for weeks. I need to sign you off. So he signed me off work for a month. No, I, that was alien to me completely. I think most had had a bit like 10 days off. Um, and I never went back mm. to work. They, um, they signed me off. Um, I spent the next 12 months assessing what it was. Turned out it wasn't the arthritis. It was a, a condition called fibromyalgia. Oh, my goodness. Now, that is, as, as I found out, I mean, I'm still learning 21 years later what it is. Um, the knowledge in the US was far advanced to what it was over here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I was getting misdiagnosed and mistreated for a long time to end with a professor who was um, really at the forefront in the UK. And he said, you haven't got arthritis. Scrap that. This is what it is. Um, and he said, you, you're not going to be able to go back and do a regular job ever again. Mm. You know, and and at that time, I mean, I had three young daughters. I was 35. Um, so I was doing a full-time job. And with work, we played football, uh, played cricket, played golf. Within 18 months, I was struggling to walk 100 mm. yards. Um, and they were saying, You've, this is sort of, this is it, which was never in my plans. And they were, what do I do? Um but I had a really good doctor, really good. And he said to me, right, you've got two choices. We can't cure what you've got, but we'll give you painkillers and take some tablets. And you can sit in the corner and you can feel sorry for yourself and do nothing. Or you can find something to occupy your brain to distract you from what's going on and find an interest and do something with that. 21 years later, here I am, the author of several books, working done one documentary, working on others. I've traveled to the US, around Europe, UK, renowned Beatles expert. None of that would have happened if, if I hadn't have fallen ill. Now, so, do you still have uh, do you still have to deal with the uh, the fibromyalgia a lot today? I mean, you still have the terrible, terrible pain. Oh yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's a constant thing. Yeah. Um, and all you can do is I keep myself busy and that way I'm not thinking about the pain. So, you know, I take painkillers um, so I take tablets to help me sleep, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, but really, the, you know, that first doctor I had, uh, God bless him, he died a few years back. You know, it, he was so wise. He said, you've got to get your head round forget you cannot now do all that physical stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got to occupy your brain. Sure. And he said, you know, what are you interested in? What will occupy your mind? And this is one of those wonderful bits of of serendipity where my wife and I do where we still are now is not far off Penny Lane in Liverpool, which of Mm -hmm. course the Beatles made very famous. Um, and at the time, our, our daughters were enrolled at Dovedale Primary School. That just happened to be the school that John Lennon and George Harrison had attended okay. when they were young. Um, and so I, I, realize, I, I, I got interested in, in the Beatles from about the age of 12 or 13 when I started playing guitar. Okay. So I was always, always into the music. But now here I was with my kids at the school where John Lennon and George Harrison had attended. Wow. Um, and my wife and I, we, we got involved with the parents' associations and stuff. And coinciding at the time when 
I was getting signed off work. We were trying to raise money for the playground. Now, having famous former pupils like George Harrison and John Lennon, that got us national media attention. Mm. Um, and the person, surprisingly, who answered our call for help was Yoko Ono. Really? Now, Yoko does not have the greatest press in the no. world. She's no, she Beatles fans. Yeah. But I have to say, she got in touch and said, John loved his time at Dovedale. How much money do you need? And we had, we'd worked out a budget. It's about £27,000. Right. Okay. That's uh, a lot of money. That. That's a lot of money for that by time. Yeah. Absolutely a lot of money. And she said, well, I want to give you £30,000 to pay for everything you want to do, have a bit of money in the fund for maintenance and anything else. And then she'd made several trips over to the school. Oh, wow. Um, and in fact, I, I got to meet her because with having no work to do, I, I became a school governor. And I'm now, I've been chairman of the board of governors for the last 15 years there. Um, uh -huh. So I got to meet Yoko with, with some of the, the school children. Um, but I just thought this was a great story. And through an event, I met a guy who'd been at Dovedale with uh, John and George. And he was writing a piece for a, a Beatles fanzine, but he was no good at technology. So I said, don't yeah, I'll send it off to the editor for you. And I said to the editor, this has just happened with Yoko. Are you interested in the story? Wow. And he said, yeah. So I wrote a piece about Yoko giving the money. And I thought, I enjoyed it. And, and I'd never written for anything before. Sure. And I thought, this was good. And he said, uh, have you got anything else? Well, I said, well, you know, is anybody covering events in Liverpool? And he said, no. I said, okay, leave it to me. And I started finding people to interview and I started writing. And that became and continues to be, in a way, my therapy. And it's just taken me to places I never expected at all. Now, see, you know, I was born in 65. Likewise. So I, I, I kind of missed the cusp yeah. of the popularity of the Beatles, okay? And in fact, it wasn't until I was much older that I actually appreciated their music. And the reason why is I had um, older siblings, friends and stuff that were like fanatics about it. Yeah. And I decided I didn't like the Beatles, not because I didn't enjoy their music. It was because I didn't like them, you know, so I didn't like their fans. <laughs> And, you know, unfortunately, I've done that on several football teams and stuff like that. It's like Dallas Cowboys, you know, kill me before I'd watch one of those games because I can't stand their fans. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, what year did the Beatles break up? Was it 69, you said? 70. It was 70. April 1970. Okay. So like you, I, I was five years old. Yeah. So I, I know nothing. But I mean, my mum and dad weren't into their music at all. Um, you know, I've just done a, a book on country music. Uh, and I'm saying the only music I think my dad and myself had in common was Johnny Cash. Oh, really? That, that, that was it. You know, oh, my goodness. Didn't like, didn't like any rock and roll, anything like that at all. Um, he's quite into um, Tijuana Brass and some of the uh, easy listening type stuff, which... No, that, that, that wasn't my thing at all. So no. musically, we were so, so different. So, so different. Well, you know, the, one of the Johnny Cash is like, because you're mine, I walk the line. I mean, and oh. Folsom Prison Blues. and yeah. I love it. Absolutely. And I still listen to it. I absolutely love Johnny Cash. Really yeah. do. Yeah. Ring of Fire. Gosh, there's just some, you know, classic, the timeless classics. Oh, funnily, Ring of Fire, bringing it back to football. I told you everything tends to come back to football if you're in Liverpool. Uh, we won uh, the European uh, Champions League in 2005. Uh -huh. And the theme tune that the fans we would sing was the, the trumpeted bit from Ring of Fire. Oh, my goodness. So, and, and I mean, we, we'd be still, I mean, obviously we've not been inside the ground for uh, 12 months or so, but that's still something that we do to this day. Is oh, when we're cheering the team on. We we do that that bit from Ring of Fire. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> that's funny. 
So Johnny Cash is <laughs> infamous among the Liverpool fans. There you go. You know, for me, because I missed um, that era, you know, because I was small. Yeah. Um, you know, my other band that I just fell in love with and still probably is in the top three bands on my phone as far as playlists is Def Leppard. You know, that was my other big Euro, you know, UK band. Yeah. And I, I went yeah. to my first concert from Def Leppard when I was 17. And, you know, it's a little different when you connect with something at that age. You know, it's a little yeah. different. You know, you're you're becoming an adult and sort of a rebellious thing and that kind of stuff. So um, how did you get connected into the Beatles? I mean, you were like 12, you said? Yeah, but it, well, it's funny because if it was music I was listening to, okay, because um, obviously we, we're born the same year, so we've had the same experience there. Yeah. Uh, my band, I don't know if you heard them of their status quo. Mm-hmm. Now, status quo, uh, I've always said they're my fab four. You know, the four of them, they were the first band I went to see live. Okay. You know, I got I got every album. I got their autographs. Um, I went to see the, the very, very final gig, which actually was, was in Liverpool uh, only a few years back. Um, so they were my band that I followed and I was still listening to. But getting into the Beatles was uh, through playing the guitar. Okay. And so when I was uh, being taught... It was, you know, it wasn't official guitar lessons. It was two older friends. Sure. Um, and they were into the Beatles. So the first music book I ever got, and I still have it held together, was the Beatles Complete Songbook. Okay. The, this, and this is where it's the genius of Lennon and McCartney. And we found this at Dovedale School as well. They're brilliant songs, but the melodies are so memorable. It's mm-hmm. easy to teach children yeah. to play the songs. And I just picked them up so quickly. Yeah. That got me into the music. And so the guitar has been that other thing which has, has stayed with me all the way through. Um okay. I still I still love playing guitar. I can't play for long, obviously, because of the illness. Um but so it was playing the music that first got me into the Beatles. Um but where it's going to see see bands live. I liked a lot of the rock bands, um, like Rainbow and Deep Purple were mm-hmm. brilliant. Um, yeah. yeah. So the, the, there's some great rock music around, which was definitely not my dad's scene at all. Yeah. <laughs> not even close. Um, but yeah, so, so, but I've always had a very wide interest in music. Um, I can remember being introduced to the music of the Eagles. Yep. Uh, who, yeah, you know, I've seen them, I think, to two or three times, yeah. Musical perfection, yeah. The kings yeah. of the kings of harmony. The Beatles, oh, I mean, my. the Eagles are just harmony. Just you know, melt your heart. Yeah, that uh, they they are just absolutely incredible. So I love, still love listening to the Eagles. Um, and then also again through friends who are a couple of years older than me, uh, been introduced to uh, the River Bruce Springsteen. Yep, yep. I've been a huge Springsteen fan. Ever since, you no. Know, every time he comes to the UK, I'll go and see him. Oh my goodness! I was in college when the River came out, and I would go to this gym at night because I um, my schedule didn't work to go to the the university's gym, so I went to a private gym over there. And the kid that ran the front desk at night just loved Bruce Springsteen. Well, <laughs> the River has some pretty depressing songs on it, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's not upbeat, you know. Well, you know, we're gonna dance type music, so. I would go up to him and I would yell at him like, can't you play something that doesn't make me want to commit suicide? This is so bad. It was, it was so terrible, but, uh, and you know, and, and I was going to circle back around to your comments about um, the melodies from the Beatles were pretty straightforward. I would not ever say that it's unsophisticated music, but very straightforward. So people could learn it, you know, that's the genius. Yeah. Because it's not easy to write. Yeah. And that's what they were so good at. They had this natural ability to hone a melody and a hook, mm-hmm. which was so memorable, but yeah. very few people could do it. Well, the thing that's uh, what I when I come back to when it makes sense for you to learn that pretty straight is, you know, and of course we didn't have YouTube where you could just pick up and you know people are doing yeah. you know covers and things of everything. Exactly. Um, if you were to compare, say 
you know, the guitar work in the Beatles music compared to say, oh, I don't know, Def Leppard, White Lightning, or some of those, you know, stuff that they're really playing some heavy riffs or oh, yeah. Rainbow or uh, Deep oh, Purple yeah. or Ozzy Osbourne or, you know, yeah. people that, you know, like Randy Rhodes from Ozzy Osbourne was one of the most under, uh, you know, heralded guitar players and stuff. The Beatles didn't play that kind of guitar. I mean, it was pretty straightforward stuff. So it yeah. makes it makes sense that you could pick that up faster without, you know, in today's day and age, you know, you can get apps, you can, you know, watch <laughs> videos, you can, yeah. you, you've got all that. But when we grew up, we didn't have all that stuff to no. learn how to play guitar. It's by ear, right? You had a record player. Yeah. And you had to play it over and over. Yeah. And keep trying to get the right notes. Think, yeah. oh, oh, that doesn't sound right. Or go out and buy the sheet music. Yep. I just I think, laugh because my kids don't even understand how bad the quality of the audio that we dealt with. I mean, <laughs> you'd put on a, a, a 45 or a 78 if you had the full album and yeah. you'd hear the scratching of the diamond against the vinyl and the crackling and the pops. And I still stuff. love that. And we loved it. We thought it was great. And then the one that always gets me is when we went to a track tape technology. And it would change channels right in the middle of the song. So yeah. you'd be right in the middle of a great riff or something. And then it would go click, click. And then there'd be a couple of seconds and then the song would pick back up and stuff. So <laughs> they don't even understand what it's like. You know, they walk around with all the all the music in the world you can have. You have access to it on the phone. So. Yeah, oh, it's crazy. I, I was probably the one, most embarrassing things is when uh, one, of, one of my girls went when she was little. Uh, and I still had my vinyl. I mean, I've still kept all, my, I've never got rid of anything. Wow. Uh, and we had a little hi-fi unit, record player on top, CD player, and a couple of cassette players. And she picked up the seven-inch vinyl and was trying to put it into the CD player. <laughs> oh, oh no. I mean, remember, there were 30, there was 33 speed, 45 and 78s, okay? Absolutely. And yeah. you, if you... There were different uh, photographs at that time where record players where you had to have the insert to put in the center to play the different, you know, sizes because the 78s just had the one little hole, you know, that went into the center. So, yeah, interesting technology. I mean, we went through a lot of that. Okay, so um, you started developing this affinity and like super fan attraction to it. When did you really start to, I don't know, I guess... I wouldn't say monetize is the right word, but when did this make this into something that you decided, okay, this is real. I can really start to be recognized as, you know, the, the, the king of the Beatles or the, you know, the Beatles historian and expert. Yeah. Um, well, that was because I started doing these interviews um, and I had so much spare time. I thought, well, I'll pick up a book on the Beatles Liverpool mm -hmm. and read about, Everything I've grown up with, you know, grown up in the Dingle, live around Penny Lane. My kids go to the school where John and George went. And all I could find was a little guidebook. And nobody had written a book just about the Liverpool story of the Beatles. So then I started reading other books to find the Liverpool stories. And I was reading that the books were conflicting with each other. And they were stating things about Liverpool, which I knew were wrong. Because most of the authors, maybe they'd done a day trip to Liverpool, but they, they had no idea of what the city is really like. Yeah, you know, so they didn't live there. They didn't play football in the streets, you know, didn't know the schools, anything like that. Exactly. So they would just repeat a few of the stories that had been told in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's the same old, let's write the same stuff about Liverpool and then go on whatever their book was about. And I thought, that's not right. So I thought... As a project, why don't I start collecting interviews and just taking photographs? And I thought, maybe I'll do a little book of photographs of famous Beatles locations in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And this just sort of grew and grew. And it just sort of became almost like, yeah, oh, next year I'll, I'll, I'll publish a book. Next year I'll do this. Sure. It was just something to keep me going. And then a friend of mine had started doing um, guided Beatles tours of Liverpool and if anybody interesting came on he'd give me a ring and basically he dragged me out of the house oh, wow. for the day and, and we'd, we'd chat uh, and this guy called Marshall Terrell came over 
and he said he was researching an article on the Beatles in Liverpool. Um, so my friend Ian said, well, you know, come out, why don't you meet him and you can chat to him? And we spent the day together and we were just going around all the famous places and I was just telling him some of the stories I'd found. I said, I've been writing about the Beatles for like nearly 20 years. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know half the stuff. You tell me, where have you got this from? And I said, well, my own research uh, and interviews. And he said, right, have you got anything written written up? And I said, well, I've probably got like what I call a couple of chapters. He said, send me a chapter. So I sent him a chapter and a quick overview. He got in touch with his publisher and his publisher rang me and offered me a publishing deal. Mm. I was of absolute nowhere. This, this is what, 2007. So I'd spent seven years already just collecting all, all of this information. Yeah. And one, of, one of those weird things with fibromyalgia, which I, I learned quite early on, was you have a, a short-term memory problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'd gone from having this, this razor-sharp memory to forgetting things I'd just been told. And one of the big problems when writing a book, when reading a book, rather, was I'd go 20 pages and I'd forget what I'd just read. Yeah, your retention was terrible, right? And awful. So I was just making notes. So suddenly I had this big collection of notes from various books and interviews. And over the next two years, we put this together and published the book in 2009 called mm-hmm. Liddypool, Birthplace of the Beatles. And it's still the only book that's been published which is specifically about the Liverpool story of the Beatles. Um, and it's full of full of interviews, all the key moments, loads loads of the people connected to the Beatles I spoke to. So with members of John's first group, the Quarrymen, Pete Best, who's the Beatles drummer before Ringo. Yep. Um, and in fact, Pete wrote the forward to the book for me, which was kind. Alan Williams, the Beatles' first manager, promoters, all these people. And then I did the back part of it, it was like um, a guidebook. So using all my local knowledge, because I know all these places, I take the photos of the places and just give like a, a brief description. You know, here's all the venues they played. And in that time of forming in 1956 to when they left Liverpool sort of 63, the Quarrymen and the Beatles played over 100 venues. Wow. And so I had a section which was just, here's the venue, this is where it was, this is when they played. So I'd, I'd put years into this thing. And I didn't expect it to do anything. Um, And I always said my level of contentment was to have a book published and to see it in a main bookstore on a shelf. That's great. And and I saw that when it came out. I thought, I'm happy. I I don't particularly care. If it doesn't sell huge, I I published a book. Well, it, it got picked up and the first edition sold out in 18 months. Mm-hmm. Um, it's in its third edition now. It's it sold quite a few thousand copies. Um, is it uh, is it available online today on Amazon or where's it yeah. at? Okay. Yeah, you can get it at Amazon. Um, there's links on uh, my website at liddypool.com. Um, there's even a, a website because of, of COVID. With I've met, I've met so many uh, other Beatles authors, most in a similar position, were, were independent. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we just uh, started a website called the, the Beatles Bookstore. Okay. Which is beatlesbookstore.com. We've got about 20 Beatles authors on there. There's about 40 something books. Wow. Um, so we all sort of help each other. So I suddenly started getting interviews. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, interviews, but then getting asked to come and make appearances at Beatles conventions. So there's a huge one called the Fest for Beatles Fans, which takes place in New Jersey. Hmm. And in Chicago. Yep. So um, fr- I think the first one I did in New Jersey was 2011, probably. Uh, and obviously, apart from COVID, I'd only missed one year. Yeah. So I've done, yeah. done that every year. Done Chicago three or four times. I've been to Washington, Stanford, Connecticut, Louisville, Kentucky, wow. uh, Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, LA. And it, it just it just had a life of its own. Wow. And I'm known as the Liddy Pool guy. And it's just, it, it's, none of it was expected. I, I really didn't expect that. And from Liddypool then came the next book, 
Fab 100 for the evolution of the Beatles. And again, it's telling the story of, of people who don't really get the credit Yeah, in the, in the story. That's what I like to do is go and find the people who play the part in the story. Um, so that one came out was 2013, which has sold really well. Then did um, Finding the Fourth Beatle. Now, it's, it's one of those things. How many Beatles drummers could you name? As far as what now? How many Beatles? So that, how many drummers? Play drums one. with it. With... Just one. And the, you just shared the other one today. So yeah. Ringo Starr is the only one I know. And so there's yeah. been four? Uh, 23. 23 different drummers? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, and th- this is the kind of thing that's... I have so much thinking time. Um, and I, <laughs> I just... Um, it's been, in fact, somebody called me the Beatles detective um, because I, that's how I, I approach something. I just follow the evidence. And yeah, between 1960, 1956 and 1970, when the Beatles broke up, mm-hmm. 23 different drummers. Now, they had to have played either a live gig um, or on a, a recording. Wow. I didn't, I never, uh, I would have never guessed. I knew. I knew that Ringo wasn't the original. I didn't know the name of the person before, but there's been yeah. 23. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay, so, so in your time of all this, you know, being the Beatles expert, did you ever get to meet the Beatles, the members of the Beatles later on in life? No. No, no sadly not. Um, got, I mean, of course, John Lennon was, was murdered back in uh, was it 1980, and then George died 2001. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it, it will be an enormous honor to, to meet Paul or Ringo. Uh, it really will be you know, a lifelong ambition to meet them. Now, um, I know you're going to already know. How old are those guys now? I mean, they've got to be. I've, I've talked about this with a, with a, um, a friend today because Ringo is going to be 82. Sorry, sorry, not 81 this year. 81 this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Paul will be 79. Wow. Yeah, it's it's funny. You think the back in the day those stars will last forever, but you know they're you know it's like the Rolling Stones when they were attempted to go on this last tour and then they got sick because, you know, I mean Keith Richards, he looks like he you know he's older than time. I think I think if you know if there was a nuclear bomb, he might he might live through it better than cockroaches. You know, it's just, uh, well, but we refer to him as the strolling bones. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And the guy never le- le- led a clean lifestyle. I mean, he smoked like a house of fire, drank like crazy. I won't even get into other stuff he was accused yeah. of doing, but goodness gracious, the guy was not a picture of health. And, you know, <laughs> he's still hanging on by a thread. And, uh, you know, you always have uh, pictures of him in your mind of, of a, a cigarette dangling out of his mouth while he's playing the guitar. Yeah, exactly. so. So I want to circle back around uh, when, because yeah. um, you mentioned this earlier, and it's you know I just have these random thoughts that come across my mind. Now, did you get to actually eat meat, um, Yoko Ono, when she was helping with the playground? Yeah, I did. So um, she uh, visited the school, um, been like three or four times, I think, over the years. Okay, and met the children, uh, and she was doing uh, a special event at. Uh, the childhood home of John Lennon. It's called Mendips, and okay. it's owned by, uh, well, it's run by the National Trust, who it's like it's a national society for protecting uh, historic buildings, etc. Okay. Um, but again, the National Trust didn't buy it. Yoko bought the house and gave it to the National Trust. Okay. So she's do- she's done a lot for Liverpool, and she was doing an event there. So whenever she was doing an event in Liverpool, she invites. Um, some of the children from the school. Mm-hmm. By that time, I was the chair of the governors. Um, so I went along with, uh, with the head teacher and we took some children and we met her actually inside John Lennon's old house. Um, and she was absolutely wonderful. Mm. She, was, she came in and, you know, she's only, only little. Yeah. Um, but she had camera crew and stuff with her and she got a PA saying, we're running 15 minutes behind. And she said, I'm talking to the children. That can wait. And she spoke to each of the children. And then she took some of them to John's room and was taking a little tour around the house. And she was saying, no, John was like you one day, but he had dreams. He achieved all this. You can as well. And it was really empowering. And she was absolutely lovely. 
with the children, you know, and we just said a quick hello. Um, I gave her a, a photo of John from his Dovedale time, which, which she'd never seen before. Mm-hmm. Um, so that I, I gave that to her. Um, so yeah, yes, yeah, she, she was really nice, very, very friendly. Well, it's interesting. I, I'm sure that as age has, you know, we all morph and change with age. Yeah. So I, I was just kind of curious because, you know, fair or unfair, she was given such a horrible reputation for being sort of the catalyst of breaking up the, the Beatles. There's probably a lot of people who would throw rocks at her if they saw her today. And then, yeah, yeah. Uh, stuff. So I, I just was just curious what she was like in person when you got a chance to yeah. meet her. Yeah, no, that, that she, she was really nice. And she does have a, a tough reputation. Um, and she's done a lot to protect John's image mm-hmm. and his reputation. Um, and she's given away lots and lots of money in the, the charitable foundation that, that she set up. And that's helped. Um, it's supported the Children's Hospital here in Liverpool. Mm-hmm. So he's helped Dovedale School. Um, Liverpool had the first airport named after mm-hmm. a person when it became Liverpool John Lennon Airport. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, because it's never a thing has been done. In fact, I think there's still only two. The second one was after a footballer, George Best, over in Ireland. Um, and we've had um, a biannual arts festival, and she always contributed wow. something to that. Well, I don't know if everybody realizes that uh, Michael Jackson bought the rights to the music, to the Beatles music. So that probably gave her a, a shot in the arm, didn't it? As well, far as financials? I mean, I mean, that was very, very controversial because Paul McCartney was working with Michael Jackson at the time. You know, sure. they, they did good records and stuff. And he'd talk to Michael about maybe clubbing together and buying the Beatles back catalog. You no, know, because Paul has bought a lot of song publishing rights, like all of Buddy Holly's songs, for example. You know, he's bought lots of, of, of song rights. And then he's had this conversation, maybe doing this with Michael. And then suddenly, sort of behind his back, Michael Jackson went off and, and bought them. Wow. And it, it's still, and it, it's a horrible thing which happens to so many uh, pop stars because when, the, when you sign your first contracts, you will sign any bit of paper put in front of you. No, oh, sure. You, you just yeah. want the dollars. You want to get started, right? Yeah. And, and you know, who's going to come out this well? It's going to be the publishers and the, the record companies. Sure. You know, how many big artists have we seen over the years, you know, take on their record companies for, for their rights? So, yeah. you know, Paul still doesn't own his own songs. Wow. Which is just crazy. Yeah, I've always been a big Prince fan. And when he was at war with um, either Geffen or Warner, or whoever his mm. uh, his label was at the time, I mean, he changed, he changed his name trying to get out of uh, you know, the contracts and stuff. So that's really that interesting. Brilliant. Yeah, that was interesting there. So I'm, I'm assuming that there probably isn't really a loss of interest in the Beatles. I mean, I'm sure it's still alive for many, many people. It, it's incredible, and it, it's something for Liverpool as a city. Tourism has become so important to us. Okay. Um, and a large part of that is the Beatles. And the two main reasons people come to Liverpool, uh, the Beatles and our football. Yep. Um, so, for example, saying when we won, the Liverpool won the European Champions League a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. A million people were on the streets of Liverpool to welcome the team. <sighs> Wow. Now, how, how, population, what's, what's the population of Liverpool right now? Yeah, it's, it's about 480,000. Okay, so double the population showed up in Liverpool. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's a passionate thing, but, you know, we are one of the most visited uh, places in Britain. Oh, wow. Um, you know, the cruise ships have been coming back in. Okay. You know, so we, we were getting like 30 or 40 cruise ships a year, stopping off for a day. You know, and that could be two or three thousand at a time. Yeah, coming into the city. Um, so about three or four years ago, they, they wanted to try and quantify how much is Beatles tourism worth to Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Um, and the conservative estimate is around ninety million pounds, and it and it's linked to over two thousand jobs. So when you think about that, that's 
it's not just all the, the tour guides, but we've got um, the cavern, which is open. We've got the Beatles Story Museum. We've got other attractions like that. And then it's all the hotels and the restaurants. And so the knock-on for a band that broke up in 1970 has really helped Liverpool's resurgence in the, in the new millennium. It, it's, it's been incredible. It really has. Well, I mean, Liverpool is a, as a football team hasn't been around since like older than the 19, I mean, the 1900s. Yeah, 1892. 18, I knew you would know 18. that. I knew you'd know that. <laughs> and then Liverpool's been around for probably ever in anybody's mind. When was Liverpool actually um, established or founded? Um, officially 1207. 1207. I knew you'd know that too. Yeah. So. No, because well, I'm. I'm passionate about Liverpool as a city, as well as the football and, and the Beatles. You know, the history of Liverpool is is so fascinating. I mean, there's there's digs which go back to the Bronze Age. Yeah. Um, you know, and because we're on the River Mersey, like anywhere, we were a fishing village, which then became, you know, a port, and we became one of the most important commercial ports in the world. You know, by the by the time you get into to the 19th century. Well, it, it played an incredible role in World War II. I mean, we Liverpool, Liverpool has a, an enormous rich history. And it's, it's, it's odd because as North Americans and here in the United States, you know, our country was, we, we you know, divorced the British you know, and beat the crap out of them in, in 1776. Okay, so we still got that one going for us. But, you know, our history is only in the, the 1500s. And so Liverpool, yeah. much older. When I used to live outside of New York City, one of the things I love to go do was stop by a cemetery. Okay. Cause yeah. I lived up in Connecticut and you'd stop by a cemetery where, you know, that the, the fact that the pilgrims and early settlers there and you'd see graves from the 15 and 1600s. And you'd be like, yeah, wow. You know, cause I was out West, you know, the town I'm from was, was settled in 1859. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's child's play compared to <laughs> yeah, Liverpool. That's modern. That's modern. You know, everything's brand new out there. So it's amazing because, you know, you, you have homes and buildings there that in Liverpool that are hundreds of years old. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Great. yeah, absolutely. It's a great one uh, called Speak Hall, which is a, um, a Tudor-style mansion. Mm -hmm. So we're going back to, you know, the 16th century. Yeah. Um, so there's some great old buildings and some of the architecture. And that's one of the great things of because um, I, I act as a tour guide as well. Okay. Um, normally, uh, obviously, that's, that's not been happening for 12 months. Um, but it, it's lovely taking people around the city and you know, maybe spending the day with them. And if they're Beatles fans, their image is they've seen black and white footage from the 60s. Sure. Of, and they think it's a sort of a dirty, industrial-type port city. Sure. Yeah. And I, first thing I'd say is, well, yeah, we've been going since 1207 officially. Said, but also we do full colour. We've got trees as well. Yeah. And, and so you, I mean, you go about two miles outside the city centre, and we've got so many big public parks. It really astonishes most of the visitors. It's not what they expect to see. Um, and then you see the architecture in the city centre itself. You know, from our growth really in the 18th century, some, some of the, that Georgian architecture there is just magnificent. Then through the Victorian age, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of uh, a lot of feature films are filmed in Liverpool. Yeah. So if they're trying to recreate Victorian London, for example, well, there's no nowhere really in London that still looks old. So they come to Liverpool, where we still got streets that look like that. Um, or you go right up to date and um, Batman, the latest Batman film has been filmed here. Yeah. Um, so there's loads of filming goes on. So Liverpool has been recreated for all kinds of films and stuff as well. So That's we great. can be basically wherever you want us to be. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming on the show today and hearing your story. I Pleasure. have never met a Beatles, uh, you know, historian and expert. And I'm sure you just have all kinds of stories. So once again, can you share your website and then also spell it because we yeah. Americans don't have quite that accent. So if you could do that for us, that'd be awesome. Well, well I'll do to make it nice and easy. 
Liddy Pool. Okay, so it's L I D D Y Pool. Dot com, right? The That's birthplace, it. Yeah. The birthplace of the Beatles. Okay. Yeah. So this is from the first book. I mean, this, this is the third edition of it. Okay. Um, yeah, that's where you can find links um, to my podcast, which we call Liddy Pod. Okay. Um, so it, we, we concentrate on, you know, the, the Beatles and Liverpool. Well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to listen in because I know n- not anything about the full history. So that's great. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating. And, you know, as I was saying, the last 20 odd years, none of which was planned. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just feel so blessed. It, it's, it's been incredible. Um, and if you like films of the first documentary, which was nominated for a national film award, um, mm. I know it's on DVD release over in the States. Um, I'm working on other documentary projects as well. So there's, it's just, there's so much, um, it's, yeah, it's just great fun. And my most recent book is the one that's just over my shoulder, um, which is a bit Beatles, but might appeal o- over in the US in particular. It's uh, called The Country of Liverpool, Nashville of the North. Okay. Nashville of the North. Yeah, because Liverpool in the 50s and 60s had the biggest country and western scene in Britain. And wow. I've, I've written about that. It's linked, our links with Nashville. And explain probably for the first time the country roots of the Beatles and there's a lot of country music yeah. and what they played and most people don't realise it um, and there was while Mersey Beat was happening right alongside it you had, you had the country music scene as well so yeah and there's always something new there's always something new to find out and for me it's always the music Okay. That's what I keep okay. coming back to. Keeps coming back to. Okay, so I've got the, my last question for you today, which I ask of all of our guests. Yeah. Um, we have this concept in our world today called a bucket list, the things you want to do before you die, those, those things that are just like a big stretch out there. Well, in the universe, there's always an opposite to everything. There's always an opposite to everything. So there's another kind of list out there. It rhymes with bucket, starts with an F, but I'm not going to say that, Okay. So that's a list of things we never want to do. I'm not going to do that. It's like one of those on my list is I'm not having sardines. I'm not jumping out of an airplane. So what's something that might know? Because we've learned a lot about you here today, David. You know how you grew up and your influences and the things there. What might be something on your effort list? Well, funny enough, the two examples you've just given are definitely on that list. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I cannot stand fish. Oh, you, of any you're not source. a fish guy. Okay. Not, not at all. And secondly, I have a real fear of heights. Okay. Um, I, I really do. So even if I'm up a ladder, you know, about six feet off the ground, I'm getting a bit wobbly. Yeah. The See, whole thought of being shoved out of an aeroplane, it would no. be wonderful. If, oh, no. No, I'd be screaming. Is it I'd be sc- into an aeroplane. <laughs> I'd be screaming all the way down. I just. Oh. Yeah, or the concept um, of it was really popular for a while, where people were bungee jumping off of bridges. No, I'm sorry, I'm not doing that. Not a chance. Not a chance. No, I, I couldn't even. Even I can't even watch people no. doing that on TV. No. You no, know, any piece of you know a movie or something, and you know where they love to keep you in suspense and they're walking along an edge or something. I get this pain in my stomach. Huh. It, and I start sweating, and that's watching a movie which I know isn't real. <laughs> So it's I, I am I am that bad. So anything to do with heights, absolutely at the very, very top. Oh, fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for coming on today, David. I really appreciate your time being so transparent, sharing your story. I'm excited uh, for you and the continued work. And his website again is L A D D Y Pool. So L A D D Y Pool. L I. Oh, L I. I'm sorry. L I. D D Y pool. So L I D D Y pool. Sorry about that. Check out his works, his books that he's done, and we'll continue to follow you. I'll probably uh, check back with you in a few months and see oh. how things are going. Love to have you on the show. It's been fantastic. It's been very educational. Feedback. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks Rex. Thank you yeah. so much. I appreciate it. Okay, folks, we're going to call that a wrap for this episode. Don't forget to stop by the website, rexandrewshow.com. Check out all of our uh, bios of our guests, uh, past, future, current, 
everybody out there, the fun things we're doing. You can also listen to the podcast there. And so until next time, I always want to say, don't forget to be safe, be bold, and make it a great day.